Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm, today, I'm here today with Paul Sheard, who is former VP of S&P Global and also the author of this book, The Power of Money, How Governments and Banks Create Money and Help Us All Prosper. Welcome, Paul. Thanks very much, Greg. Pleasure to be here. Now, I, I really like this book, um, and partially it's because I, I like books that, you know, try to s- simplify things. You know, I think oftentimes in academia, we start to get really complex really quickly, and then we kind of forget, you know, the, the basics. And, you know, I know a lot of people who are in the world of finance who, if you ask them, you know, what's money, they, they, they kind of get a little confused, <laughs> you know, like what's credit? and so forth. And I think part of what you're trying to do with this book is you're trying to overhaul how we talk about things like public debt, about money creation, about uh, fiscal and monetary policy, mm-hmm. and, and all, all the rest of it. And, you know, that conversation, I mean, it's not like the conversation that you have in, in the media is different from the conversation you have in academia. I mean, I think that the conversation you have in the media is inspired by the kind of the ways that people talk in the halls of the Fed and the way that people talk in the halls of academia. And so I think you're, you're trying to replace kind of all of that. And, you know, when I think about macro, right, and I think some people were traumatized by macro in school, I think macro sometimes to me has two different definitions. You know, one is that, you know, it concerns itself with the monetary economy as opposed to, to the real economy. Mm-hmm. But I also think of macro as having to deal with kind of, you know, general equilibrium as opposed to partial equilibrium. And, and so I think what you highlight is that a lot of us suffer from, you know, the composition fallacy. Mm. <laughs> We're talking about things like, like government debt. And I said, I think you're trying to kind of use both definitions of macro to, to get us to rethink this, these basic um, terms mm. and, and concepts. Um, and, and, and presumably if we did this, th- this would have profound policy implications. Um, and so I, I guess the question is, mm. After all that, <laughs> is, is this way of thinking, I mean, because you were a practitioner, you were out mm. in the field, you worked it with banks and so forth. Do, do practitioners think of things differently or, or they, do they also, you know, use the same language as the, the public and academia and uh, policymakers use? Mm. Well, Greg, thanks very much for having me on. It's a, a real pleasure and an honor to be on this podcast. Um, to answer that question directly, um, I think that... Um, Practitioners do follow the lingo and the, and the same way of looking at things, but they're also a, a lot more um, open to different ideas. So, uh, and there's you know the, the markets are a very kind of uh, competitive space, free entry, free exit. And so, it, compared to academe, where there's a fairly sort of narrow kind of framing of things, um, things are corralled into a kind of uh, conventional wisdom or consensus about where the field is at. I think in the markets there's just much more of a plethora of kind of competing ideas. But if I could just dovetail into your introduction a little bit, sort of you know what my book is about and why I wrote it. Um, I actually started out life as an economist, an academic economist. Even spent a year at your illustrious institution on sabbatical back in 1991, Stanford University. And I was more of an economics of organization, uh, micro industrial organization economist. But of course, you all have to do your macro as well. And I you know, taught a bit of, tutored a bit of macro. It's very familiar with the field. And then I went into the financial markets in the mid 1990s in Japan. I was a Japan economy specialist. And you know, Japan was a very it was a laboratory of interesting macro stuff that was going on in the 1990s with the unwinding of the asset price bubble of the 80s, financial crisis, banking crisis, then deflation, and then all of this unconventional monetary policy and fiscal policy concerns as well, mounting debt levels, etc. And so, you know, as a chief economist, first of all for Asia and particularly focused on Japan, and then later on global chief economist. And then, of course, everything goes global with the 2008 financial crisis, and we have quantitative easing and all that sort of stuff. So, so I was basically sitting there in Japan, and you know, if you go back to 2001, when the Bank of Japan launched its first round of quantitative easing. So I had sort of like a front row seat 
And as somebody who came into the markets from academia, you know, I, look at, I try to look at things in a very sort of analytical way, try to understand what's going on, but also the institutional foundations, not just the high level. So macro is very aggregate, but I like to dig into, you know, what's the plumbing of the system as well. So I had to start, you know, looking into this, you know, what is quantitative easing? What's the Bank of Japan doing? How does that relate to what the government is doing with its fiscal side? Then, of course, I realized that actually the central bank is part of the government. We, we tend to sort of look at the central banks as being separate from the government, but they're actually independent within the government, not independent of the government. So fisc- I realized early on monetary and fiscal kind of plumbing very closely intertwined. And to speak to your point of how do people in the markets think or how, how do policymakers think, we've sort of, for good reasons, understandable reasons, developed this sort of world where we think of monetary policy as being one thing, that's the preserve of independent technocratic central banks. Then we have this fiscal policy, but that's the stuff that's separate, and that's the stuff that politicians have to deal with. Where in actual fact, they're actually very, very closely intertwined. And so, anyway, cut a long story short, you know, as I spent a couple of decades or more talking to clients, with clients, because they're very intelligent people, they have their own views, and there's a cut and thrust, and writing, you know, weekly reports on this stuff, I, I very much came to the conclusion that um, there's a lot of misunderstanding in this area. I don't think the, you know, we academic economists covered ourselves in glory in the way with the clarity with which we explained many of these things. And in the markets and in the policy world, there's a kind of um, conventional language and way of thinking which is really at odds with the underlying reality. So a lot of misunderstandings. What I wanted to do with this book was not write a book, a sort of an academic treatise that would sit on a bookshelf somewhere, but rather kind of say, look, this is how I understand things and try to explain and sort of dispel many of the myths and misunderstandings um, and put it, you know, pitch it to the sort of ordinary people who think they understand it, but actually they don't, or they're confused, and you know, it's my shot at shining a little bit of light on monetary and fiscal affairs. Yeah, I was going to say there are no equations in the book, but I guess technically there are. <laughs> there are some you know, equalities in, right. in there. There's a few uh, identities. For, <laughs> yes, yes, but no, no numbers. <laughs> it's just, you know, identities. But, you know, I, I, I liked, I, I've come to the realization that, you know, when I learned in, in civics about the three branches of government, you know, legislative, judicial, and, and executive, the, you know, that that's a very incomplete story. Right? <laughs> At the very least, we should have the banking system in there as sort of a, a, a fourth, you know, branch of, of government. And, and so I think, you know, you draw a distinction between kind of a kind of, I guess, fundamental or foundational mm-hmm. approach to looking at these things versus an, an institutional approach. Now, you know, I do institutional economics. So, you know, I, I like to say, you know, the, the institutional architecture, you know, matters, right? And it does. And you explain, you know, why we, we, we have this, this division. But, you know, you hypothesize, like, what would it look like in this, you know, Garden of Eden world mm. where, where we, we just stripped away kind of the institutional uh, complexity and just got after the, the fundamentals. Um, and if we do that, we come away with a very different view of, of money and, and, and debt. So, um, Maybe we can start there hmm. and and say, you know, what is the most fundamental misunderstanding that, that people have about hmm. money and hmm. governmental hmm. policy with respect right. to, to money and government debt? Great. Um, yeah, great question there. And I'm glad you picked up on the distinction I make between, uh, you know, describing the system in terms of how the institutions actually function and then what's really going on. Uh, on under the surface at a very sort of fundamental level. That's what I call the monetary garden of Eden. I kind of betray my Catholic upbringing there with that term. But um, just a little bit more about the the book. One one of the things I, yeah, there's, you know, my my bookshelves and I'm sure yours as well, filled with books on money. There's lots of books on money. And there's a lot of books on the history of money. Fascinating books. Um, By the way, I I start off my, I teach money and banking and I usually start with you know, history of money, mm. <laughs> and instead of spending an hour on it, I mean, I spent like the first couple of weeks on it, right? It's, money exactly, history of money it's, it's fascinating. And of course, you know, every chapter on, on money, any, any paper you pick up will say, well, money has three functions, uh, unit of account, medium exchange, and um, store of value. 
And then economists will typically, so you'll have the history of stuff, but then you'll have the definition, money has to have these three functions. And then economists tend to sort of jump to um, measuring money. So we have all the M's, the monetary aggregates, and the M zeros, and you know, MB, monetary base, M0, M1, M2, M3. And economists have you know, got into all sorts of debates about which one's the right one, and do they matter, and all that sort of stuff. But what I kind of noticed over the years and you know, in the markets and just thinking about it more is there's very little um, description or understanding of, well, how does money actually get into the system? How does money get into circulation? And it's sort of like we take that for granted. So my book sort of starts off trying to explain that. And, and most people, if you ask them that, well, where does money come from? They, they would think they understand. They'd give you some answer. And they'd say, well, central banks create money. Or um, they would say that you know, banks collect savings. And you know, that's sort of the money that is in the economy. Um, or they'd talk about governments borrowing money. But... All of those things are actually wrong or, or kind of not really accurate descriptions. And so I think that's the, the key kind of canonical misunderstanding. It's not well understood how money comes into the economy. And, and I use a kind of, and I'm not, I don't have copyright on this. I think some other economists use this uh, analogy. I kind of like to think of the, the bathtub example. It's a bit crude. But think, and you mentioned monetary and real economy. Because money, we're talking about the monetary economy, this virtual economy, this sort of imaginary economy. Um, the, but of course, it's all in service of the real economy, the goods and services that are produced. That's really what's important to people and to everything. But you need the money economy to, to fuel the real economy. And so I think of the, the bathtub as being the real economy. And, but you know, this is where it starts to break down a little bit. Of course, the real economy is always expanding. So GDP in the, in the U.S. at the moment, the latest figure, is pushing $28 trillion. But if you went back like 10 years ago, that was about um, uh, 16 or 17, about 17 trillion. So in a decade, real GDP, uh, well, sorry, this is actually nominal number because money is nominal, just using the, the nominal number. So nominal GDP, but that's still the real economy, has gone from about 17 trillion to about 28 trillion. So it's about 11 trillion. Now, what's happened to money? Well, if you just took M2 as, an, as sort of the basic, probably kind of best overall measure of the sort of money, you know, bank deposits, cash in circulation, some other things as well, that's about 21 trillion. And you know, 10 years ago, that was about 11 trillion. So it's not one for one, but roughly in the last decade, US GDP is up 11 trillion, M2 is up about 10 trillion. So that's the water, the, the money is the water in the bathtub. So you have this bathtub that keeps expanding, you know, hopefully, because the economy expands, and you want to have the right amount, roughly the right amount of money in that bathtub. If you have too much money, it overflows, you might think of that as inflation. If you don't have enough money coming into that bathtub, as the bath or water, as the bathtub is expanding, um, you get cold and you could think you've got deflation. So in some sense, you need kind of more or less the right amount of money in the bathtub, but the bathtub keeps expanding. You need these sort of you know, taps that are pouring money into it. So how, what is that process? Um, and, you know, I... I Basically, there are three, three ways in which that money gets into that bathtub. And the first one, and I think the main one, uh, is through bank credit creation. So this is the, one of the first kind of misunderstandings, although it's kind of the story is getting out there better now. More and more textbooks and, and books are sort of recognising this, which is that banks create money when they lend. The act of lending is the act of so the act of credit creation is the act of money creation. Um, that's incontrovertible. And yet so many people, Greg, have this view that somehow banks are taking in deposits and lending those deposits out. Well, the deposits are already money. You can't take in... Uh, a, a, where, does, where do deposits come from if you're taking them in from somewhere? That's people putting banknotes in the... In the, in the bank, bank, but where do those banknotes came from? Well, originally, out of a bank account. So it's very circular. 
So it's, that's the first kind of common misunderstanding, that one of the main ways in which that money gets into the bathtub is through banks, bank lending. Um, and, of course, banks are therefore really mission critical to the financial system, to the economy, um, and they're kind of connected to the central bank and connected to the government through, you know, you have to have a banking licence to create this money, but they're private sector entities. The second way in which money comes into the economy, and this is a bit trickier terrain, is sort of completely different. It's a different way of getting that money into the system, which is through government spending, government, governments running budget deficits. So all a budget deficit is, is the government injecting more money into the economy by, by its spending decisions than it's taking out via its taxing decisions and, you know, or sort of net taxes if you take into account transfers. So if the government runs a budget deficit of, say, you know, I don't know, pick a number, a, a, a billion dollars, small number for the US, a billion dollars, that just means that they've injected at the end of the day a billion dollars more money into the economy than they've taken out. And so the, the you know, again, we all kind of in, intuitively know this at some level, well, you know, too much government spending creates inflation, but, uh, and that, um, but, but there's still a lot of mythology about this and misunderstanding. For example, we talk about government debt. We talk about the government borrowing money. We talk about the government raising money by taxing. All of those things are true at one level, if you like to describe it that way. That's the institutional level. But really what's going on under the surface is that banks, sorry, governments create money when they spend. So they don't actually have to borrow money. That government debt is not really debt. We call it debt, and it looks like debt, but it's not debt. Why do I say it's not debt? What I mean by that is it's not debt in the sense that if you went to the bank and borrowed $1,000, you would have to pay it back. Or if you lent me $100, you know, you're know, you not giving it to me, I'm going to give it back to you when, I have, when, I, when I've got the money. Um, government debt is not like that. Government debt never has to be repaid as such. It's a little bit, it's actually just a different form of banknotes. And if you want to be convinced of this, I probably can't convince many people because it's so ingrained. Um, I should have a $20 bill with me. I usually flourish one around when I have this conversation. I'm sorry, I forgot to, forgot to bring one. But um, you know, a banknote, if you took a $20 bill, right, that's a Federal Reserve liability. And the Federal Reserve is a part of the federal government. And in fact, if you look at a banknote in the US, it's signed by the Secretary of the Treasury and the U.S. Treasurer, which is a separate position. Um, it's not signed by the Chairman of, of the uh, Chair of the, of the Federal Reserve. It is a federal government liability issued by the central bank. If you took that liability, that debt, to a bank or to the Fed and said, "I want my money back," well, they just take the twenty-dollar bill and give you twenty-one-dollar bills, or they maybe they just give it back to you. Money just is. It never has to be repaid. And that's, of course, the whole point of a fiat monetary system. That's what it means to be in a fiat monetary system. Well, to you know, cut a long story short, government debt, this so-called $33 trillion, by the way, that's a very misleading number. You'll hear this all the time. It's not $33 trillion. It's um, substantially less than that, but we can come to that if you're interested in fleshing it out. Um, is a little bit like just $33 trillion of banknotes. Um, now, can you have too much of that? Yes, if you have too much money chasing too few goods and services, you get inflation. And we saw an example of that in the last couple of years. So this is not to say that government debt doesn't matter. You know, for one thing, it, it may be an indicator of the pervasiveness and the size and the intrusiveness of government in the economy. And that can matter. That matters a lot to people on more the right end of politics. And it really matters in terms of too much money, too much government debt, which is money, can, generally, will cause inflation. But it doesn't matter because it has to be repaid. It doesn't matter because it's somehow a burden on our grandchildren. 
No, they're just going to inherit a stock of money, which is purchasing power, and they're going to inherit a lot of real assets, infrastructure, scientific knowledge, all sorts of stuff, which is pretty good stuff. Um, so we shouldn't be losing, this is going to be one of the sort of the, the misnomers. Yes, if you want to worry about government debt, worry about it for the right reason. Don't worry about it because it's some kind of mythical burden. Mm. Now, look, there's a whole bunch of insights in there. And, and some of them are exclusive to this notion of you know, fiat money, of government-created money. But a lot of those insights apply also even to the private creation of, of money, right? Mm -hmm. So I usually, when I do my financial history lectures, you know, I go back to you know, the days when uh, the governments had less discretion. And a lot of those same principles apply, right? You know, that you can, you know, manufacture these negotiable instruments, right, simply through a, you know, ledger entry, mm -hmm. right? And, it, you know, you can do this as, a, as, as an airline, right? <laughs> you can say, all right, we're going to create some, some miles, right? Yeah. And Bam, you know, we, we've, we've, we've got some miles and the, the value of those miles will depend presumably on the redemption policies of the, uh, of the airline uh, going forward. And um, I, use this, I use this way of thinking about the balance sheet in my corporate finance class. You know, I'll say, we have a tendency to think that uh, a company, you know, like, like General Motors uh, goes to the capital markets to raise capital to fund the construction of an auto plant, right? Mm -hmm. But an entirely different way to think about it is that they're not in the business of making cars. They're in the business of selling securities. And, and in order to make those securities attractive, mm -hmm. they need to go and, you know, build a plant. <laughs> and so it's, it's the, the, the plant that is, exists in order to give those, you know, securities uh, value in some way. And so mm. in some sense, if we can look at the government as being in the business of selling these these instruments that that people want right you know people right. want money right for for various reasons and they and they want the, the the government to some degree is right in 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 the in the money creation business and 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 that that adds value right that supplies that we we demand liquidity yep. we we demand these assets right no you're exactly right and and again um the government running a budget deficit spending more than it's you know, injecting more money into the economy than it's taking out via taxation um, is exactly that. It's a way of supplying, you could call it liquidity or money or purchasing power to the economy. And that's, that's very, very necessary. And, you know, in, in finance, we talk about the safe asset, uh, the risk-free rate, right? Um, government bonds, and I'll sort of come back to government bonds because how they sort of exactly fit in maybe in a moment. But we see that as a safe asset. And what that is, is a way of transferring purchasing power through time. Uh, th so that's a very important, that's a store of value aspect of, of money. So this is a completely, you know, particularly I think maybe in this country, but no, I guess what we'd say in Europe as well and in Japan, so it's much more widespread. There's a very widespread kind of idea that somehow, you know, the most virtuous thing is a balanced budget. Um, government deficits are, are somehow bad. Um, this mounting, this mountain of government debt is, is this bad thing and a burden on, on the future population. Well, that's like saying we, want, we have this expanding bathtub and we need water, the water level in the bathtub to keep expanding as well. But we want to turn off one of the taps, the tap, the government spending tap, the government deficit tap. Well, if you do that, Greg, you're going to need to turn on the bank credit creation tap much, much more. So much more water comes, much more water comes out of that. So yeah, the basic insight here is that you know government debt, government spending. I mean, it has various elements to it, but one of the very important things that it allows is for money to be created and for purchasing power to be transferred through time. Can I take a minute just to maybe bring? close the loop a little bit here because I think some of the listeners and viewers might be a little bit kind of confused at this point because it gets quite complicated because you know I keep sort of saying well government debt is not really debt it doesn't have to be repaid but you know people are going to say but well, hold on a minute there's two-year treasury bills and there's five-year treasury bonds and 10-year and 30 years I mean these things come due and the government has to repay them 
But this is where you get into the institutional layer of the economy. It's precisely because governments can create unlimited amounts of money if, through their spending, and it's precisely because if we let them do that, or if they let themselves do that, uh, we'll get too much money in the economy and we'll get inflation. That you know, over the last 50, 70 years, maybe a century, we've we, society, have devised these institutional frameworks that put and checks and balances, checks and balances basically, you know, and shackles, and speed bumps and shackles yeah. on the ability of the government to engage in that unlimited money creation. And that's one of the elements there is the independent central bank. Um, one of the elements is is saying that the government cannot run an overdraft with its own bank, that is the central bank. And one of the elements is saying, well, because of that, when governments do spend, when they do run a budget deficit, they'll have to issue securities first to raise the money, which in a sense they're then going to create through their own spending. So money creation by running a deficit is dollar for dollar offset by bond issuance. But the right way to think about that is essentially just transforming what bond issuance is, is just transforming the nature of the money from money, money, bank deposits or reserves at the Fed into something that looks like it has to be repaid. But actually, push come to shove, it really doesn't have to be repaid. And another way to think about this is, and I don't know if you want to get into quantitative easing, you know, what the heck is that? But one of the things I realized in my, as I was looking at this stuff back in the Japan days, was that, if I just talk about quantitative easing for a moment, if, if I may, what that is, is the Fed, the, let's talk in terms of the Fed, buying government debt securities, that is, liabilities of another part of the federal government, and in exchange issuing its own liabilities, which is central bank reserves, the deposits that commercial banks have at the Fed. And it's, it's, a, it's a dollar for dollar sort of transformation. And there's, there's one key difference between the liabilities that the Fed issues when it buys those treasury bills and those treasury bills or treasury bonds which have this due by date on them, which is central bank reserves have no repayment date attached to them. They're just like a digital version of banknotes. So you can go from, if you sort of go in reverse from treasury bills being bought by the Fed, that turns it into an instrument that doesn't have to be repaid. And if you know, the next step is then to actually convert that into banknotes, which is what the public does. So when the public takes out money from the bank, it's draining those digital reserves. Now. Again, why does, you might say, but hold on a minute, if the Fed does unlimited quantitative easing, isn't that going to cause def uh, inflation? <clears throat> well, not really, because what we now see in the banking system and in the way the Fed operates, since 2008, the Fed is paying interest on reserves. The interest rate at the moment is 5.4%. So in some sense, what the central bank reserves are, which and how much is it's an interest, it's like interest bearing, it's like interest bearing money. bank notes. Uh, and, and if if the public was holding that, and you know, with CBDC, a central bank digital currency, we potentially could get there. You could have a digital version that has an interest rate attached to it. So the interest rate mechanism that the Fed uses with its monetary policy can still be preserved in a world in which, in the in the extreme. All of the government debt securities that, that in, in some sense had their genesis when the governments ran budget deficits and created the money can be converted back into that primitive form of money and the central bank can control inflation through its interest rate policy. And that's really the world where kind of it's a halfway house. We still have a lot of government debt securities out there, but we also have the Fed increasingly, and other central banks, the Bank of Japan being probably the most prominent, sort of operating as, you know, a sort of quasi-treasury. Um, yeah, well, I, I remember um, when I learned macroeconomics, there was a, a great deal of emphasis placed on the, um, you know, open market operations and, you know, emphasizing the, the important difference between money 
and and debt, right? Uh, or what they meant was sort of you know highly liquid, non interest bearing, right? Debt and um, you know interest interest bearing debt that had some some maturity, and and these were seen as sort of categorically different. And I remember I, I took this one class with a professor of mine. I'll, I'll give, shout out his name, you know, Yamshed, Jamshed Gandhi, uh, who who had a very interesting career as an academic who ran a bank, and um, and he ma- made it clear, like, wait, where where is this clear line? <laughs> right? I mean, uh, you know, treasury bills are 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 kind of like money, right? And and then well, what about you know, treasury treasury notes, right? I mean, at, at some point. You know, your money market mutual funds are, are, are money and, and maybe even your house. <laughs> you know, your house, you can, you know, you can, you can spend your house if you want to, right? You get a HELOC and now you can, you can start buying things with a piece, with a chunk of your living room. I mean, what's the, does that distinction hmm. kind of make sense anymore when we're thinking about monetary well, aggregates and everything? Well, well I, do, I don't think, it, I don't think it does. And it's a very interesting point you raise, Greg, because for some reason, and I don't, never actually been able to, figure out maybe it's in Keynes or something somewhere but economists don't think of uh, government debt securities treasury bills and treasury bonds as being money so in the in the macro models we treat this as being an, an asset um, and you know money is something else money is you know bank deposits and cash in circulation and stuff like that um, and you know I guess the rationalization for that is to say that well uh, you can't actually take your T-bills and go and spend them. So it's not really a medium of exchange. It's certainly a store of value. It's certainly um, in the unit of account. It's the government money is you know, it's in the unit of account. But it's not actually technically used as a medium of exchange. So if you wanted to be very purist about this, and depending on the definition you could use, you could say, well, technically speaking, government bills and bonds are not money. But to me, that's not a very insightful way to think of things because if, okay, t- take that definition of money that you want to use, well, you're only one tiny step away from it being money. And guess what? It started out as money. So by you know, the government creating money, then quickly, in some sense, sterilizing the money into a form where it's not a direct medium of exchange, um, you've technically made it not money anymore. But, you know, quantitative easing has shown that it's just one tiny press of a button away from being money again, which is, is what quantitative easing has done. And I think quantitative easing, in a sense, um, you know, has blown the cover on a lot of this stuff. Because, um, you know, take the Fed, for example. If you went back to 2008 when the financial crisis happened, the Fed's balance sheet was about $900 billion dollars. And it was, it was relatively small because the Fed, in those days, didn't pay interest on reserves. And therefore, what that, there's, a, there's a corollary of that, which is if the Fed doesn't pay interest on reserves, or any central bank, but it wants to target a non-zero interest rate, a positive interest rate, then it has to make sure that it drains the reserves, which are created by government spending, partially, uh, into it down to the minimum reserve level. So if you went back to 2008, you know, minimum reserves, and this is all very circular because minimum reserves are themselves a rule that's imposed by the Fed. So the Fed says, okay, a certain, if banks have a, cer- a certain amount of deposits, they're going to need to hold a certain amount of reserves you know, on deposit at the central bank. Now, if you go back to 2008, Greg, balance sheet of the Fed was about $900 billion. Um, those minimum reserve requirements were only around about $45, $50 billion. It's a very small amount. But the, but the corollary was that if the Fed wanted to have a federal funds rate of, say, 5%, it needed to make sure that through its open market operations that you mentioned before, it's, it, it bought enough securities that it... Oh, sorry, it, it sold enough securities to drain... Um, or the government, sorry, put it this way, the government, through issuing bonds, effectively drained those uh, reserves down to the minimum reserve requirement. So bond issuance, in this view of the world, is much more of a, it's not done to borrow money, it's rather done to drain excess reserves 
so that the Fed is able to target a positive interest rate. So this is, in a sense, one of the, the underlying reasons for this misunderstanding. Treasury issues bonds all the time. It looks like they're borrowing money, but what they're really doing, that money's already in the system. It's been created through deficit, uh, deficit spending. And what they're doing is dra helping the Fed imp implement its monetary policy by draining excess reserves. Now, sorry, long explanation, but the, the, the big punchline is all of that has now changed because the Fed in 2008, actually as part of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the TARP legislation, acquired the ability to charge interest on reserves. Now, it was going into zero interest rate territory. It didn't need that ability then for a few years. But when it got to eventually to th end of 2015 and then again post-COVID, March 2020, it had massive excess reserves in the system. But it wanted to raise interest rates. Well, that was able to do that because it had acquired the ability to now pay interest on reserves. So, again, that's kind of what's going on here. It's got nothing to do with borrowing money and having to repay it for the future generations. It's got to do with making sure that we have those shackles on government so that it doesn't abuse its privilege of having this printing press. What is the printing press? Not the printing press of the Fed, but rather the printing press of being able to inject money into the economy through its spending decisions. Right. And so the focus should not be on the uh, amount of debt the government has, but, you know, how, how is the government spending its money, right? So, you know, you, you said people are concerned about leaving their grandchildren, right, with a, a huge pile of, uh, of debt. And... You know, it certainly makes sense at the at the individual level that you don't want to you know burden your your kids with a whole bunch of of debt. But in our case, we're we're handing our kids a whole bunch of debt, but we're also handing them a whole bunch of bonds. Right? So exactly. It's 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 a it's a, it's a net wash. Um, it is exactly and, uh, for, for, it, for an intergenerational perspective. And this is again, people only focus on one side of the balance sheet. You know, any good any good accountant and hopefully any good economist has to look at both sides of the balance sheet. And you're exactly right. And can I just say something about this thirty three trillion dollar number because it crops up everywhere. That's the the gross amount of federal debt that's issued. But there's a good chunk of that is held within the government. The Social Security account, for example, holds treasuries. So that's just an internal wash. And the number comes down to about $25 trillion if you net that out. But the Fed, which is also part of the government, owns about $5 trillion uh, of, of, of treasuries. And you can sort of net that out as well if you're concerned about the amount of public debt that looks like it has to be repaid. So we get down to about $20 trillion when you do that. Well, it's a $28 trillion economy. So the one example I use in my book is if you had, if you're getting $28,000 income, you could probably support a $20,000 debt. But again, it's not even debt because that money never actually has to be repaid. And the, again, if you're not convinced of that, just imagine that the Fed, which is part of the government, bought all of the outstanding treasuries, converted it all into central bank reserves, and charged in interest rate on those reserves. It would be just like treasuries, except it actually doesn't have to be repaid. Well, I think the, the reason why people are, you know, concerned is that, you know, they really are concerned that we are not thinking carefully about how we're spending the money, right? And so if we, if we couldn't finance it with debt, then the, the pain of the expenditure would become more visible. I mean, look, it's not the spending of the money that is the the cost, right? The cost occurs in the real economy, mm. right? If yeah. if the government decides to, you know, build a dam, the the cost is is not the money it's spending. The cost is the you know the cement, and the and the labor and the you know the the steel, which would otherwise go towards towards other other purposes. But in, unless somebody writes a check for it, we it's sort of you know, it's diffuse and it's invisible. And, and so I think that's the concern, right? Yeah. The, the I think that should be, no, you're absolutely right. That should be the concern. And again, um, that should be where the focus is, is um, 
Exactly what you say. I mean, and, and that's where the political battles obviously have to be fought. You know, one is, you know, how big should the government be? How big a role should the government play in the economy? And if you think it should have a very, very limited role, then it's not going to be creating very much money by its spending compared to a very, very intrusive, very, very, um, you know, expansionist kind of government. But, um, and I think what happens in the political debate and the policy debate which then kind of spills over into the journalistic world and also to a, to a large extent to the market world, is um, using that language as a shortcut, a sort of circuit breaker. So it's much easier to say, oh, there's a mountain of debt, we're burdening our grandchildren, we have to rein this in, than saying, you know, that bit of spending over there, that program, I think we should rein in, Maybe we should abolish it. And having a debate, in some sense, on the merits of the programs, it's much easier to pretend that the limitation is the money when the limitation is really the resources that the, that, that the economy can command. Well, so some people would say that you know, quantitative easing has essentially stripped the, the government of its sensors, of its, of its radar, right? So it, it doesn't have visibility into kind of the, the consequences of, of its spending in a way that it might if I ha if it had to actually kind of go to the markets mm -hmm. and, and sell these these debt securities. I mean, w w what's wrong with that that perspective? I think um, I think one thing that might be wrong with it, if you, I mean, I think you, it's kind of a, it's, a, it's a good insight that. Um, if so, take my example that is a kind of you know, reductio ad absurdum. What would the world look like if, if we said, like the government said, look, we're going to do away with this whole idea of worrying about the mountain of debt and everything else and repayment. That's not the issue. The Fed is going to hold all. Uh, it's going to refinance essentially all of the government debt into central bank reserves. There'll be a lot of it, and it'll just put an interest rate on that, and put the interest rate up and down, and it'll control monetary policy. Well, now we're living in a world where there, there is no bond market. So another way of framing your question is, what would be the consequences of eliminating the bond market? The economy would still James, be there. James Carville, James Carville's life would be easier, <laughs> right? 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 <laughs> you know, so remember, I think what you're, saying, his quote. what you're saying, Greg, is, well, you wouldn't have then the market discipline, this, this market discipline. And of course, um, and this is really very important for, the, for there to be some kind of not just political uh, restraints on government decisions through the Congress and through the whole political process, but also a kind of parallel market process as well. So I think that's an that's an argument that you can make, and you know, uh, fair, fair enough. But it's it's a different kind of argument. I push back a little bit on that in the sense of, of making two points. There will be a camp of people um, who will say, you know what? Partly as a result of the way we've done all this, we've created this excessive financialization in the economy. And I lived, you know, I spent 23 years as a markets economist, you know, talking to clients. And, you know, you end up, guess what you end up doing a lot of the time? Fed watching, ECB watching, Bank of Japan watching. We have this, um, you know, there is, a, there is a, you know, a lot of resources are drawn into financial markets because everybody's watching the Fed and everybody's watching moves in the yield curve, up and down the yield curve. Now, you know, you could make the finance argument that all of that stuff is it's pricing risk, it's disciplining the government, it has these, these benefits. Um, but you could also make the argument that the amount of financial activity that you probably need to get those benefits is much, much, much more, uh, sorry, much, much less than the amount of financial activity that we actually end up getting and having. So, you know, depending on who you're talking to, I think you, 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 some people would make a case, say, look, we'd be a lot better off if we closed down the bond market um, because we would not have this excess of financialization. The, Another argument that you could back on to that, and again, I'm, I'm really throwing these out there for discussion rather than banging the table, but if you go back to, remember, around the turn of the century, I think you might have just referenced it before, um, maybe, there was this period where it looked like government debt was going to disappear. 
And then, yeah. you know, the Fed actually... And that's when that's when all the commercial paper came in, right? right. And so right. that's, that's the, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, the problem with Lehman was all the, you know, the, there was all this commercial paper floating around because there weren't enough treasury bills, right? right? So exactly. pri private entities got into the business of, of selling and, this and stuff. If you go way back, I think it was around about 2000-ish, um, the Fed actually put out a paper saying, uh, you know, discussion paper through their, their research department of, well, how would we operate monetary policy and what would it mean for the economy if there was no debt because we were running these wonderful surpluses, the surpluses that, you know, disappeared pretty quickly. Um, and I think, you know, one of the conclusions you'd come to there is that the market would probably deal with that. It would innovate. And so your risk-free-ish curve would probably be the AAA rated corporates. And, you know, securities and arbitrage would be <laughs> Call Quote it risk-free. Risk <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's that argument as, as well. Um, but I think, I don't know, I'm kind of a little bit old-fashioned in the sense of saying, and what I'm trying to do in my book, Greg, is say um, at least we should have, you know, what we do with this knowledge is one thing in terms of, you know, re uh, you know what do you do with all these institutions? But at least we should have the right fundamental understanding of what the heck is going on in this incredibly important part of the economy, the whole monetary system, fiscal and monetary policy. And we shouldn't be having our public discussions, our public discourse, and our policy uh, discourse and decisions being based on a foundation of you know, misunderstandings and wrong language. And we might stumble into the right decisions and we might get some side benefits. But it's a very kind of, um, I don't know, to me, suboptimal way of operating. Well, now, some people might say, okay, fine, I, I get you, Paul, right? Um, you know, we just owe this money to ourselves. But, you know, when we're running massive deficits, then we owe the money to, you know, the Chinese, right? We owe the money to, to folks outside. And so, you know, our children will be spending their lives, you know, manufacturing stuff that they'll be shipping out to China, Right, in exchange for all the stuff that we consumed that mm. were made by Chinese people. So, you know, we're living high on the hog, right, with all these cheap TV sets. And, um, you know, our, our kids are going to be slaving away to, you know, make, uh, you know, I don't know, steak for, mm. the, for the Chinese. Uh, and they're not going to be able to consume steak themselves because they'll, they'll just be spending all their time paying down all these debts. Um, I mean, if if that was all positive NPV investment, you know, all the money we're borrowing from the Chinese, we're, we're plugging into, you know, productive assets, that's great. But if it's just financing our consumption of, you know, these cheap TVs, then how, how are our kids going to benefit from that? Mm. Yeah, just to put that in perspective, and that is an argument, and it's, you know, it's much easier. It's a pretty compelling argument if you just say, look, I think of the whole world as a whole um, and the inter intergenerational transfer, because then it is the case that, Every dollar of treasury or government debt security is a dollar of asset for somebody else. So the, 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 the distributional issue, because the future generation is going to inherit the purchasing power, and the government as a whole, taxpayers as a whole, is going to inherit the debt. And yes, within a generation, they completely cancel out. But you do have distributional consequences, uh, you know, within the generation, the future generation. But again, that's kind of life. Life is unequal. Life is unfair. Um, nothing, there's nothing equal about, about anything in the, in the natural or the economic uh, universe. But when you introduce foreigners into the picture, that's the sort of, yes, but. But some of these future, uh, you know, the, 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 the people who inherit the debt as an asset are going to be Chinese or Japanese, or Saudis, or something. And just to put this in perspective, if you net out the debt that's held uh, within the government itself, so you really get down to this 25 trillion or 26 trillion, around about 26 trillion dollar number, a little bit less than GDP. Well, f how much do foreigners own? That's about a little bit less than 8 trillion. So we're talking about 8 trillion out of 26 trillion. It's not insignificant, it's about a third or so. But what does that actually mean, Greg? I mean, first of all, as you said, um, you know, that's coming about because the U.S. is running a current account deficit, which means that net, net, it's accumulating, it's importing goods and services at a, you know, above what they're exporting. 
So the Chinese are slaving away in their factories, and you know, we're benefiting from it. And that's going to be, have to be reversed at some point. And that's kind of true. That's an intertemporal kind of you know, a transfer going on, which you know, is all based on voluntary exchange. So from that perspective, nobody's holding a gun at anybody's head and forcing them to buy a Chinese TV or you know, whatever. But what would the future look like? It, it, it's still going to be the case. Let's say we go 50 years in the future. The Chinese have got all these treasury bills. We haven't had a geopolitical event where they've been frozen, as has happened with some countries. And the, the Chinese start running a current account deficit vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. And you know, within that's going to show up essentially somewhere at some point as their treasury holdings are going to come down as they convert those treasuries into purchasing power and they're buying so many products, Hollywood movies and you know, whatever the future products are, that they're running a current account deficit vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. Well, now put yourself in the place of that person who's writing that script in that Hollywood studio or the person in, you know, again, we're in the future, so God knows what sort of products are being produced, spivvy kind of futuristic products are being produced by, I don't know, people are writing code for artificial intelligence, bots, you know, whatever. Or we're just making widgets. Well, the people, you know, who are making those widgets in the U.S. in the future are selling them to Chinese, and they're getting income. In other words, the purchasing power that the Chinese have accumulated which they're holding partly as treasuries, they're now, they, they are trapped in the U.S. system as well. They can only use that purchasing power to purchase goods and services out of the U.S. And I don't think it matters too much to the man or woman who's you know, making those widgets and they go out the door. Well, not to, not to them, but who, to the who, people who, who would them? otherwise... Yeah, I mean, the people who uh, you know, would otherwise be, be buying the, the beef steaks, the beef steaks are now... You know, not available for them. They're they're priced out mm -hmm. because they're selling to the to Chinese. So, I mean, if if we're going to focus on the real economy, then you know we're going to focus on on the 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 lack of availability of those real assets to the to the Americans, right? Yeah, but I think all of those decisions. I don't. I don't really. You know, I, I have a lot of trouble tracing all that back to like where we started this conversation with, with you know, is, is the government spending too much money? Well, you know, in some sense, again, it's the job of the Fed to control inflation. The biggest problem with, you know, the government spending too much money is going to be that it's going to cause inflation. And if, if it does that, it's going to run into a bit of a, a speed bump. Now, sometimes, you know, the horse bolts for a while. That's what happened in 2021, 2022. But... Um, you know, I, I look at the economy as, you know, it's largely a decentralized arena where the Chinese and the Americans and everybody are making their decisions. You're talking about then, I mean, the thing with government spending is now we're talking about Congress. And yes, Congress is a messy place. Um, but the perspective I would have on, if we take this into Congress, is I think the perspective that you would probably want Congress people to have is other decisions that they're making good for the American people in t and, and good for future generations in the sense of what is going to determine the prosperity of future generations is not how many treasury bills the Chinese hold, but rather how productive the U.S. economy is, how much you know, how much physical capital, infrastructure, how much human capital, scientific knowledge, social capital, has it accumulated? That's really what determines prosperity. And, and that's, the, that's the lens through which I think we should be looking at government spending. Yeah. So is, is it a positive NPV investment, in other words? You know, is yes. it going to increase the, the value of the taxable assets in the future by more than it's going to you know, reduce them yeah. in, in, in the present, right? Yeah. And I'm certainly Counting not going to... I'm certainly value money. I'm, I'm certainly not going to sit here and, and, and sort of put myself as a defender of every decision that the Congress makes. I mean, far from it. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, some people would also criticize uh, quantitative easing for the redistributive effects domestically, right? And in particular, the impact on, on asset prices, right? Mm. And so some people would say that, you know, this is effectively keeping you know, distorting interest rates mm -hmm. in, in a way that would lead to 
the rich getting richer because we see all these assets, you know, go up in value more perhaps than they, they would otherwise. And, uh, and it's these redistributive mm. consequences. Now, presumably you could, you could fix them through, you know, tax policy and so forth, but you know, that doesn't happen. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, if, if it was all unified, then you could, you could do it all together. But, but, you know, given that the, the, the monetary folks are doing their thing and, and the fiscal folks are doing their thing, I mean, should, should we worry about yeah. that? No, no, I think that's a very good point. And again, I've spent a chunk of my last you know, 20 years trying to explain what quantitative easing is. But again, I'm not here to sort of defend it and, and, and say, and in fact, I sort of argued the opposite, Greg, which is to say, um, why do, what, what is quantitative easing? I mean, one way of thinking of very broad brush is when do we see quantitative easing? Well, we, historically, we saw quantitative easing when central banks ran out of interest rate ammunition. They cut interest rates to stimulate the economy to achieve their inflation targets and their employment targets, you know, full, of, full economic activity. They hit the zero bound, and then they said, well, hold on a minute, we're supposed to be the ones running the economy, managing the macro economy. What are we going to do next? Well, the next is quantitative easing. But if you think about what quantitative easing is, and I'll put it in, in, in somewhat technical terms, not always looked at this way, is it's essentially a debt refinancing operation of the consolidated government, whereby the government, via the central bank, retires government debt securities and refinances them into central bank money. So you mentioned the finance perspective. You can think of an MM theorem, Miller Modigliani theorem. You just, you know, any. CFO or any corporate finance MBA student uh, or graduate would, would quickly get this. Aha, that's what QE is. QE is just changing the capital structure of the firm, but the firm now is the government. So, you know, you won't have a 100% irrelevance theorem because central bank reserves, the asset that is created, or the liability that's created, sorry, asset for the people who hold it, um, is not a perfect substitute for the asset which is being refinanced out of. So you have some asset substitution effect, and that's what you get, that's the monetary easing effect. But it's pretty damn limited, right, particularly if interest rates are very, very low to begin with. So what I'd argue, Greg, is, yes, you can understand quantitative easing, you know, the so-called portfolio rebalance effect, People's eyes start to glaze over when you say that. You know, it has some kind of stimulatory effect through asset price moves. Asset prices tend to be pushed up with quantitative easing, and there are sort of finance theoretic reasons for that. Um, but you know, I talk in my book about Sheard's theorem, which is that you know, if a central bank gets to the point where it is having to use quantitative easing and do so on a large scale, that's really a sign that fiscal policy needs to be playing a much more proactive leading role in macroeconomic policy management. And here's where we kind of run into a bit of a problem, which is the framework that evolved in the last 50, 60 years to deal with the problem that governments can cause inflation by spending too much money, creating too much money, so we, we sort of give the job to this independent central bank and we put sh shackles on the fiscal authorities. That was a brilliant mechanism or institutional framework for solving one set of problems. But it had a blind spot. And the blind spot was when you had maybe a crash after a financial crisis or maybe a period of what uh, John Williams and others termed a low R star, that is a very low natural interest rate, such that you hit the zero bound a lot, monetary policy becomes relatively impotent, not totally impotent, but we don't have a framework, particularly in the US, with the separation of powers in particular, where you can coordinate monetary and fiscal policy and coordinate and maybe joint mobilization. So what that leads you to, getting back to your question, uh, is that your, the central banks, and the Fed in particular in the US context, had to rely inordinately on a tool which you could argue had was very low potency and had associated with it these side effects of um, very indirect... And, and monetary policy itself is very indirect. 
it operates through financial conditions, which means it operates through financial markets and security prices and bond prices and equity prices and foreign exchange prices. That, and then the economy has to somehow react to that. So I think when you think deeply about monetary policy, it has an advantage, which you sort of touched on before, which is it uses maximal use of markets, financial markets in particular. But it may lead to over-financialization, and it may lead to sort of distortions that perhaps disproportionately favor uh, asset holders, the rich and wealthy, and much, it's a much less efficient way of helping the poorest people in society. Now, we, we have to talk about crises um, because, you know, crises are a, a monetary phenomenon to some degree. And um, you lived through one of them, right? Uh, you were at Lehman Brothers back in, in 2008 when uh, it, it collapsed. And, um, you know, I, I, I bought a whole bunch of Lehman stock <laughs> the Friday uh, be before it, it collapsed. Because, you know, I was a, a, a student of Ben Bernanke. I mean, not an actual student, mm. but I read quite a bit of his work and, and uh, particularly his work on the Great Depression. And I thought, this man will never let this bank collapse, right? This, this man, you just, if, if anybody else were in charge of the Fed, they might let it collapse. But this man will, will never let, right, an institution like Lehman Brothers collapse because he knows exactly what's going to happen. And so I was... You know, I bought the stock at like, I don't know, it was like $2 a share <laughs> on that Friday. And, and then, of course, I lost 100% over the weekend. But, um, you know, when you go back and you, you revisit that, I mean, the people who were involved in that decision, they said that, oh, yeah, you know, we didn't want to have moral hazard and so forth. But, I mean, it seems there must be, there's more to it than that, mm -hmm. right? I mean... If if you if they if you sat down with 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 Ben Bernanke and and Tim Geithner in a room today and you said hey do, do you do you regret that decision mm. I'm guessing that they would have to say yes because you know the not, the, not, the amount of the firepower they had to right <laughs> but the amount the of record. firepower that they had to bring out afterwards was far greater than the amount of firepower mm. that they would have needed you know beforehand right yeah. and and obviously you know I don't have any sympathy for for Dick Fold or anybody else and and uh, certainly don't have not crying my milk, you know, that lost a couple thousand bucks, but it, it does, it does seem um, that, you know, we, we could have done things differently there. Yeah. And, and I do, I have, a, as you know, I have a chapter in my book on financial crises, you know, what can go wrong with money. Um, and I talk about the Lehman example as well. I was the chief economist at the time. So I was there to the bitter end and, um, you know, lost a little bit more money than you did. I would guess, uh, hazard to say, because I didn't sell any stock. Um, or oh, yeah, you, know, you have deferred options and all that sort of stuff as well. So, um, but I argue in my book that, you know, again, stepping back as an analyst, I think it was a, a mistake not to do some kind of Bear Stearns-like operation with Lehman Brothers. Now, you know, I'm going to have a very hard time convincing anybody that I'm, you know, I don't have a conflict of interest by, oh, well, the chief economist of Lehman, they would argue that. But I do sincerely believe this just as, as, as an analyst. Um, and I didn't buy the story at the time. And, you know, if you look, if you go back to that 2008 period, March was the Bear Stearns operation. The Fed took about $30 billion of toxic assets off Bear Stearns balance sheet, and then JP Morgan took it over, um, and there was a first loss um, uh, protection on that $30 trillion, uh, sorry, $30 billion. And, you know, so it was a kind of a bailout uh, with the central bank organizing, uh, organizing it and chaperoning it. They didn't do that with Lehman, and now Lehman was four times bigger. And so that was one argument. But if you look at the record at that time, what what policymakers argued, Ben Bernanke in particular, and he gave a speech, the first speech was about a month after, and he sort of explained why did they bear, uh, bail out Bear Stearns and why did they bail out AIG and not Lehman Brothers. And the whole argument was this sort of legalistic argument, but I think it was really at some level a political argument. But the legalistic argument was that the Fed was claimed, that the Fed did not have the authority to do anything with Lehman Brothers under Section 13.3. If I just get into the weeds a little bit here, because you did ask the question, um, Section 13.3 is this unusual and exigent uh, clause. It's the lender of last resort. 
clause in the central in, in the Federal Reserve Act, and it's, it was revised under Dodd Frank. But at the time, it basically said that. Um, in circumstances, these are the unusual and exigent circumstances, where a, an entity, a person, a partnership, a corporation, anybody, cannot obtain uh, funds from anybody, so they're cut off from, from markets, nobody wants to lend to this entity, the Fed can uh, provide unlimited li liquidity. But the proviso is that they have to take uh, collateral to the satisfaction of the board of governors, satisfaction. Now, if you if you add all this together and say, well, this is a lender of last resort clause, what it's basically saying is, look, this, the Fed can can not invoke this clause without good reason, and cannot just willy nilly do, 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 uh, deal out money. It has to take collateral and has to be kind of satisfied. But what the Fed did was interpret that, and the Fed lawyers are saying, well, satisfied means they have to have, you know, 100% guarantee on the collateral. Well, there's already an internal contradiction here, Greg, because if you're looking at an entity in a financial crisis, a run on the banking system, a run on the financial system, and nobody in the world is going to lend any money to this entity, obviously, you're going to ha have a hard time saying, oh, I can find collateral that I'm 100% satisfied with. It just doesn't make sense. And I think that the intent of the word to the satisfaction of the Board of Governors was really a kind of do your due diligence and, you know, as a lender of last resort, you know, do your due diligence and make sure that you're satisfied that you're doing the right thing and you're taking some collateral, etc. And this, so I don't really buy the Fed's argument, but there's a much, there's a political economy sort of story here as well, which is the reality of, of the circumstances of the politics of you know, the dying days of the second Bush administration, as it was, was that, you know, it was probably, there was no TARP at the time, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. There was no framework in the US that the federal government, the Treasury, through the Treasury, could inject capital temporarily into the banking system to stabilize the banking system and save the financial system. You could argue, and many people did argue, that it was only because Bernanke and Paulson let uh, Lehman go under that that caused such a panic <laughs> that Congress ended up, at the end of October, passing the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which authorized $700 billion of capital to be injected into the banking system, and well, that saved the day. And if you remember that episode, Greg, um, the Senate passed the legislation, but first time round, the House of Reps voted it down. The stock market crashed, the world was going to end, and then they passed it in a week later. So, you know, from a, from a kind of analytical, what should they have done, uh, idealistic point of view, I think that Lehman should have been handled differently. And I think if the Fed had come in with a program, there would have been a buyer. Um, it was sort of like a catch-22 because you didn't have, the Fed was saying and Treasury was saying, we can't do a Bear Stearns operation. So naturally enough, there was no buyer. But if you'd had a Fed, a Fed Bear Stearns type operation, I think there would have been a buyer and they would have averted the worst uh, outcome, but then things would have been so calm that you probably wouldn't have got the tarp, and that was the tarp, and you know a lot of that money was was uh, was deployed very quickly. That I think Greg was the killer app in stabilising the financial system. But then you could argue, but you only needed to stabilise it because they pulled the plug on Lehman. So we go around in circles here to a large extent. Now there was also a chapter in there on the EU and um, you know how people. Uh, look, misunderstand hey, how the EU operates and how, you know, ultimately, if, if you're right, that w we should expect to see greater political consolidation. Um, but I wanted to ask about Argentina because um, I just came back from Argentina and there's some interesting things going on there. Uh, and, you know, in a first best world, it would never make sense for a country like Argentina to, to dollarize or to, to have a peg. But we don't live in a first best world. And, you know, we have institutional realities. And, you know, sometimes you need these, these checks and balances when, when the political system is, is not uh, functioning. Um, do, you, do you think um, 
I mean, the benefits could outweigh the costs for a, a country like Argentina to um, have something like a, a peg and have something uh, like uh, dollarization, um, ignoring, of course, the, the transition costs, mm. which are probably insurmountable for a country like Argentina. Yeah, I have to think. Uh, you know, I have to say that I, I'm not an expert on Argentina, and you know, maybe emerging markets more generally. I'm not kind of um, not as in the weeds on all the ins and outs of it. But um, you know, I, I, I guess I would come down a little bit like um, you know, if it's the absolute absolute last resort, maybe you do something like that. You dollarize. But from my kind of framework, you know, because it's the ultimate shackles. It's the ultimate discipline. On, on, you basically take away the sovereign right to create money. Yes, you, you're not going to have a problem with the government spending too much money. Um, you, you do create a situation now where the Argentinian government, in order to spend, essentially has to borrow in dollars. They don't have a dollar printing press. So it's the sort of the ultimate way. It's like Greece, it's like right, Greece on right. steroids, except you, you don't have a nice, beneficent... Right. set of Germans to, <laughs> to, to bail right. you and out, right? that's my beef with the Eurozone, is that the Euro is a construct, is, is, is sort of separate, it, it does, it takes a separate monetary and fiscal policy and makes them even more separate and basically turns every member of the Eurozone, Euro area into a country that effectively is having to borrow in a foreign currency. So it takes away a lot of policy flexibility um, and, and so I think ultimately they're going to have to merge monetary and fiscal policy and get better coordination, et cetera. But getting... It's mm. kind of like California. I mean, California is dollarized, right? California is, is, is right, like Greece right. to some degree. So getting, state, back to, right? yeah, so getting back to Argentina, I mean, I guess the problem is Argentina is not a state of the United States like California is. So I guess I would, you know, if maybe it's, it's a last resort that needs to happen for a while, but the other alternative, you know, is uh, and is basically to try to get your act together domestically with the institutions. Um, and I guess the problem is that the that you know, so you know, they cannot, they don't have the domestic credibility to be able to create shackles and put them on themselves. And they've tried it several times, and it's never kind of worked. So. It's not my first best solution because the problem with dollar again one problem with dollarization in is that you know Argentina now in terms of that bathtub that we talked about before it has no control really over that water and it's really handing over the keys to the castle to the foreign markets to um, uh, you know foreigners and and they're going to they're going to tighten the screws on Argentina. Now again, that's sort of what Argentina wants and needs, but where does it end? And you know again, drawing the parallel with the euro area is that I think kind of people underestimate how important an element of sovereignty it is for a sovereign government to be able to create its own currency and to be able to manage its own uh, monetary affairs. So um, I would much prefer the other course of if they're going to do something this drastic, have a really sort of adult conversation about, hey, we really do need to put shackles on the fiscal side and those shackles have to be tight and we really do need to give, you know, make an independent, technocratic, credible um, central bank. So it's a form of credible commitment by the government to itself and to the public to be responsible with uh, with its fiscal and monetary affairs. Well, Paul, thanks so much. We didn't even get to talk about CBDCs and, <laughs> and crypto. Maybe we'll do that another day. But you do have a chapter in there on that topic. Uh, the book is called uh, Power of Money. Maybe it'll get incorporated into the, the textbooks uh, going forward. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, Ray. It was wonderful to have a chat. And I uh, do appreciate, uh, at least virtually at least, uh, getting uh, back into the, the Stanford community. Unsiloed Podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution 